Good day, everyone. Uh, this is our presentation on uh, Global Cities. We're focusing on Jerusalem, a global city divided. My name is Vincent Josh Alborja. Together with me are my fellow groupmates. I'm Enrique Angles, yeah. I'm Michael Luis Idom Lao. I'm Kisha Tat. I'm Kian Fong here. And together we're Group 1. Again, we're presenting Jerusalem, a global city divided. So just a brief rundown of what we chose uh, as, a, as our global city and what is the main problem facing the city. So since the 1940s, the city of Jerusalem has been under siege by a complex array of different nations who have claimed it as their own capital. So this is Israel and Palestine. Both Israel and Palestine maintains that its capital is the city of Jerusalem. However, neither is recognized internationally. Until, until today, Jerusalem remains one of the most disputed areas in Asia and in the world. So there's a lot of historical nuances that have played into how uh, Jerusalem exists today uh, and its divisions. So the conflict has the conflict shaping Jerusalem today has its roots in the early 20th century, particularly after the Balfour Declaration of 1917. So it's most it's most closely related to the ideology that Jewish citizens and Israeli people have to have their own Jewish state after the onslaught of the Holocaust, after the uh, the purge of Jewish people in Europe and elsewhere during the, the Second World War. After the Second World War, uh, the Jewish people have decided to take over this piece of land called Palestine, which had uh, Arabic roots already. There were already many uh, Muslim people leaving living in this, in this part of the world when they came. However, in 1947, the United Nations proposed partitioning the land into Jewish and Arab states almost arbitrarily, leading, leading to the 1948 Arab-Israeli War and the establishment of the state of, is of Israel. Needless to say, this has caused much controversy. After the war, Jerusalem, which is the center of both Israel and Palestine, was divided into two different distinct areas, the West Jerusalem and East Jerusalem. During the Six-Day War, uh, after the Six-Day War, rather, Israel subsequently annexed Jerusalem, and now it has occupied more than 90% of historical Palestine and subjected millions of Palestinians within, living within Jerusalem to an apartheid system where Palestinian people are dictated by military checkpoints, permit systems that restrict mobility, and a separation wall that has divided communities in East and West Jerusalem. As you can see in the maps on your screen, there is a stark divide between the racial uh, the, the racial demographics of these two parts of Jerusalem, and it has traced its roots from the Arab-Israeli conflict that has been going on for so, many, for, for so long. Um, because of this uh, historical background, we have uh, decided to choose our social issue, which is the duality of Jerusalem, the, essentially how Jerusalem now is divided into both the West, which is predominantly inhabited by Jewish Israelis, and the East, which is primarily populated by Palestinian Arabs. This division is the center point of all the tensions and accusations of racial discrimination and apartheid in Israel, as Palestinians in East Jerusalem continue to face systemic inequalities, restricted access to resources, and limited political representation compared to their Jewish counterparts in West Jerusalem. These um, different issues have been been marked almost symbolically by a separation wall that divides Jerusalem into two dif different cities in the same place. And we decided that this is literally and figuratively the conflict of modernity. So just to um, bring up some, some, uh, a fascinating quote from a book by Lemire uh, called Jerusalem, History of a Global City. He says that Jerusalem doesn't belong to itself. In the world, Jerusalem isn't even in Jerusalem anymore. Jerusalem is a global city, a city where the whole world meets periodically to face up to, to confront and to size up each other, reflecting how Jerusalem has been the subject of so many conflicts in modern history until today. And yeah, so there are different, as I've said, Jerusalem is the center of conflicts between um, what modernity should be and what modernity actually feels like for many people. And there are three main different angles into which we've uh, explored this conflict. We call these the conflicts behind the conflict. Um, so handing the floor over uh, to the first member that we'll discuss is uh, Marco. Hello. Okay, so I'll be talking about the, as Jen said, inclusivity versus exclusion. Now, just as I mentioned, there is a division between the Jewish and also the Palestinian community. Not only that, but Israel and the Jewish community are covering a big portion of the land that Palestine wants to be their own. In the map shown that Zen uh, showed previously, uh, we can see that the Jewish community is slowly trying to regain the power of Palestine by physically building houses and structures to claim their land as theirs. In class, we discussed global cities and nations, and this can be used when examining the definition of nations in the political sense that nations are political entities with their own governments, laws, and political systems. They have sovereignty over their territories and make decisions that affect the entire country. Not only that, but nations are states with defined geographic borders. Meanwhile, global cities are not political cities in themselves. They usually are part of a bigger political structure, such as a nation or a region, and they are, uh, they are ultimately subject to the laws and governance of the larger political entity. Now, in relation with Jerusalem, it is considered a global city because although there is a border and a clear divide between Jerusalem and Palestine, it is not fully settled in yet. Because of this, it cannot be a true nation as there is not a clear division between Israel and Palestine because they both claim Jerusalem, the entirety of Jerusalem, to be their land. Now, on the topic of inclusive uh, democracy versus racial exclusion, uh, not only that, but with the previously mentioned definition, Israel is a global city trying to act as a nation. They have a democratic government disguised as one of the favorites, uh, 
that, that favors the Jews, as stated before, the continuous building of the structures to try and claim their land as their own by the government is done by Jerusalem. But if we look and examine this, we can obviously see that this isn't fair for the Palestinian people. Why are uh, the government, why, are, why is Jerusalem uh, government doing this? It feels unfair for the people who are living in East Jerusalem. This is because Jerusalem prides itself in a more democratic government. It gives a say to, uh, it pretends to give a say to everyone who resides in it, which includes Palestine. However, because of the nature of democracy, those in the majority will always, gonna, will always be the ones trying to invoke change. This is unfair for the Jewish community. This is unfair because the Jewish community is more than the Arab community. Next slide. Um, however, democracy is not the only way that the government is trying to push away Palestinians and claim their land as their own. As we all know by now, there are more violent ways that Israel, that Israel is doing other than building infrastructures, which will be further discussed in the next slides. Thank you for that, Marco. So now, I will be talking about the respect for human rights versus the rights to self-defense. So in order to understand what is happening in Palestine, we first have to go back to where it all kind of started recently. So on October 7, 2023, Hamas militants launched rockets and opened fire in a music festival in Israel. More than 260 bodies were found and many have reported to be missing in what was supposed to be a fun festivity. Soon after, the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, announced that Israel is at war after the Gaza surprise attack. Since then, the spotlight has shifted towards Palestine and Israel. News reports of attacks from both sides, particularly from Israel, have continued to flood the news. In recent reports, Palestinians in Gaza have been enduring weeks of bombing and ground invasion from Israel. These attacks have not stopped, and refugees are given impossibly little time to recover and escape. People all over the world, and even the internet, are polarized on which state or nation should be rightfully justified. However, we all have to remember that while each day, passes by without effective intervention or decisive solution from institutions that are supposed to intervene thousands of people die on the ground so in the self-defense versus human rights aspect as previously mentioned israel and palestine have already had a very long history of conflict it has all started uh, since the 20th century both nations claim to have a right over the land of jerusalem with backing from history and geography in the eyes of israel however they consider their recent attacks on palestine as mere self-defense against Hamas. Hamas. Israel has marketed their actions as a way to win or gain victory in the long-standing conflict between them and Palestine. And how, rather, however, these continuous attacks are not only damaging properties but have also caused severe deaths and trauma among people, innocent people to be exact. The bombings ha happening in Palestine have been targeted at public infrastructures like hospitals, churches, and schools. These occurrences simply imply that the cost of winning or defending Israel's people is through lethally oppressing Palestinians and sub subjecting them to their inhumane circumstance right now. So what does this all mean? So although both sides are lobbying or trying to fight for their own welfare, we beg the question whether the measures taken in order to gain this success or peace, as they may say, is still justifiable. Considering that these actions have deprived the rights of innocent people. So, basing from our previous lessons in so social science, uh, we believe that these uh, actions are not justifiable and certain institutions like the UN should be intervening in, the, uh, in these situations. Considering that if we talk about it in a sense of globalism, we have to consider that the interaction between two different states or nations should have uh, some sort of regulation. So, that's it for my part. Uh, more of that will be discussed in the next uh, topic, subtopic. Thank you for that, Kira. Now we'll talk about sovereignty versus multilateralism, relating it back to social media and pretty much how Israel became so-called the enemy versus the world. So there could be multifaceted reasons why Israel receives significant foreign support, despite massive criticism from journalists and news outlets. There's a prevalent sense of sovereignty in Israel justifying their actions. This divide leads countries to choose sides, despite criticisms of Israel's ongoing conflict with Hamas. Israel has dismissed ongoing criticisms as self-defense. However, questions arise about what even self-defense means after numerous atrocities have been done. End definition. Yes, they are practic practicing sovereignty, but it's gotten to the point where it becomes too excessive. They are not just protecting the Israeli people, but they are painting the Palestinians as the enemy. And it has manifested no room for political discourse in which sovereignty loses its complete meaning. Such sovereignty is being broken down to pure self-defense, but is led to genocide, and Israelites are all for it. They take back what's supposedly theirs, and there's no stop for it. Perhaps there's a sense of self-determination amidst the historical background during the 1940s with World War II of the effect of Israelites remains prevalent. But it should not be made as a main point to expressing sovereignty for such mass genocide amongst the Palestinian people. 
Thus, this definition of sovereignty breaks the ignorance of Israel with its actions. It leads to a much more one-sided political discourse amongst its neighboring countries and even the world. Countries such as Russia, China, and even the USA, major big countries, despite them being a main contributor to Israel, deadly self-defense with USA tactics. In, uh, in essence, it has become such a diplomatic crisis that it has led Israel's self-determination against the world. Now, the tension persists, persists until the present. Is the divide in Jerusalem and the mass genocide in the Gaza Strip the spirit of sovereignty, or is the rest of the world delusional trying to ease in the spirit of multilateralism and trying to communicate and unify for the sake of stopping this so-called sovereignty? It has become this tug-of-war game as it is unbelievably difficult to present who is suitable, representative, and objective right. Thus, all types of conflict around the world arise, and a concrete example of this is in social media. People confining each other's social media identity purely based on their stance and especially is seen in Israel and Hamas conflict, is indeed a diplomatic crisis. But in the digital modern age, it is nearly quite impossible to find unbiased information that can help support your personal advocacy. News outlets, social media personalities, threads, and even this information narratives are scattered across the web. One concrete example is in this is a Twitter comment thread that I just saw like literally yesterday. In one post, you can see a comment a thought user commenting a propaganda image saying Zionism equals ISIS. And once you scroll down this two posts after, you see a user posting a video interview of a woman describing terrorist acts done by Hamas. In essence, such divide is inevitable, and this sovereignty versus multilateralism is indeed a back and forth argument. But when a country exercises sovereignty, it opens a path to multilateralism. At the same time, when a country enters multilaterally, multilater multilateral relations, they're exercising their sovereignty to protect their nation. Moving on to the next part. Um, yes. Thank you, Kian. So uh, what the last few parts have shown is that Israel, despite framing itself as a bastion of democracy in the Middle East and becoming a liberal democracy in the modern world, it has many contradictions that have subjected its own people, Arab Palestinians and Palestinians alike, to massive atrocities. And these contradictions are the root of it. Um, looking outside the conflict, however, we see that modernity is also a global problem. And we can also see how the effects of modernity trickle down to other places, especially like the Philippines and Manila. Moving forward, we'll talk about these kinds of parallels and how, how better we can resolve these conflicts moving forward in the future. So I'll hand the floor over to Jay. Okay, so it's important to know that these ongoing issues and conflicts within and concerning Israel should not be ignored. But drawing closer to the heart of the issue, we see it becomes a matter of perceived neglect and identity. So not strictly limited to the, to the identity of the people, but uh, more on to the land that they live on. We see a similar case with the Moro or Bangso Moro people of Mindanao. They have inhabited the southern regions of the archipelago for centuries, their communities predating even the arrival of the Spaniards and their attempts at evangelization. Now, having remained a predominantly Muslim religion naturally isolated the community from the rest of the Christian country. However, the conflict in Mindanao is not typically characterized by Christians trying to quote-unquote reclaim land from Muslims. Instead, it has been more about the grievances their differences have created concerning historical injustices, marginalization, cultural differences, and the desire for self-governance and recognition from the predominantly Christian central government. Within the past century, there have been at least three notable events that have further reinforced the Moro people's quest for independence, all of which relate in some shape or form to oppression and the, un and the unjust loss of life. So the, Jeb the Jebediah massacre, a purported massacre, consider uh, is considered a flashpoint that ignited Moro insurgency within the country, spurring the birth of Islamic separate, separate organizations such as the Moro National Liberation Front, or MNLF, and subsequently the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, or the MILF both of which seek autonomy for Filipino Muslims called Moros. So the siege of Zamboanga in 2013 and the siege of Marawi in 2017 were more armed conflicts that claimed hundreds of thousands of lives, predominantly fought between the Philippine government and extremists, note on the extremist is Islamic groups. So tensions remain high, evident by a recent, uh, recently, a recent deadly bombing at the Catholic Mass in Marawi on December 3, 2023, that Islamic State militants claimed responsibility for. President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. condemned the attack. Now, given the size of the affairs in both the Israeli-Palestine conflict and the Mindanao conflict, Receiving international attention and involvement was inevitable. Both have been focal points for international diplomacy and peace negotiation for decades. Now, these are a handful of similarities between the long-fought and unfortunate situations between the two cited cases, such as arguments for historical roots, religion, and most importantly, political autonomy, self-determination, and international involvement. Modernity's dominant characteristics such as globalization and information exchange, modern nation state and information exchange, modern warfare and technology, and international law have undoubtedly exacerbated this issue. By examining the shared characteristics and lessons learned from both conflicts, we can contribute to a more nuanced understanding and work towards sustainable, solution, uh, sustainable resolutions. These are resolutions we're prepared to propose. Zen? 
Thank you, Jay. So just as Jay has mentioned, while the situation remains very, very delicate, there is, it is not beyond repair. There are many solutions and ideas that have been proposed in order to resolve the conflict, and these are the four most mainstream. The first and the most popular solution being floated around is the idea that Israel and Palestine should coexist as two separate independent states. This means that Israeli people will have their own Jewish state and Palestinian people will have their own Arabic state following the current borders. But however, however, the belief in the possibility of this solution has dropped significantly, with surveys showing that both Jews and Palestinians refuse to have this division. They want the entire place, they want the entire country for themselves, and this result this resulted in inevitable continuation of the war. Because of this, the second solution proposed by many stakeholders such as uh, foreign leaders, uh, in this case, Muhammad Gaddafi, the leader of Libya before, um, proposed that Israel and Palestine, Palestine should just be one country. This is called the one-state solution, which would merge Israel, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip into one big country. One, this is favored by leftists and Palestinians because it would create a single democratic country. However, Israeli people refuse this because it would mean that Muslims would naturally outnumber the Jews and they don't want that because Israeli people want Israel to be a Jewish state. And this couldn't work if they all exist under one democ democracy. The third solution, which is uh, a, a proposal set out by the United Nations, is that Jerusalem, the city, um, should just be a, a, administered as a special international regime, which means that the United Nations and no country, no specific country, not, not Israel, not Palestine, will be in control of, of Jerusalem. This is called corpus separatum, which is described in the resolution 181 of the United Nations General Assembly. This has not been repealed and, is con and continues to be the official position of the United Nations. Lastly, in one of the more niche solutions is the confederation model, which means that Israel and Palestine will have some, some level of governance, some level of autonomy, while maintaining each state's independence. So this is like a blend of the two-state and the one-state solution, wherein um, Israel and Palestine both coexist as separate states, but they also have shared governance in a lot of areas. These solutions, while they're not concrete, are still some things that uh, diplomats and experts continue to debate about, and there's still uh, a long way to go for before these uh, resolutions finally um, solve the conflict in Israel. With all of that uh, being said, the final takeaways from our presentation are simple. Firstly, is that Jerusalem, as we've shown you, is the clearest example of how a city can be in the heart of the conflict of modernities and how modernity has disproportionately served a few while failing others. The contradictions and conflicts of modernity have forced Israel to become what it is today. The war exists because modernity exists. And because of these conflicts, both Israel and Palestine do not know how to end the war in a way that satisfies both of them. Like the Philippines, there are two parallel and separate versions of modernity evident in, 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 in the tensions between religious uh, groups, just as like Jay mentioned. However, the issues that, like these tensions are not beyond repair. Well, far from current reality, solutions are out there and there's lots of work left to be done, uh, which means that modernity is not really set in stone. We hope that you enjoyed uh, listening to our talk and learned a lot. Um, that is, once again, Jerusalem, a global city divided. Thank you.